Hey, Al Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's our friend Sheldon Richmond. He's the vice president of the Future Freedom Foundation and the editor of their journal, The Future of Freedom. Hey, Sheldon, how are you, man? I'm doing fine. How are you, Scott? I'm doing very good. Very happy to have you back on the show. It's been way too long. Uh, but yep. you write a, about a lot of interesting things other than foreign policy, and so you know, I read you, but I don't always interview you. But uh, right. so... Uh, very important article here. We're running as the spotlight today on antiwar.com. Uh, a, a really good uh, piece of work you put together here. The Open Thank Society you. and its worst enemies, and this is the the goal of this freedom column from uh, last Friday. So I guess, you know, to start us off here, um, I think I want to bring up this Patrick Coburn article. I don't think it quite matters if you read the very last one I read. Or not, because uh, you know what he has to say about this stuff. Mm-hmm. He's describing the rise of jihadi terrorism across seven or more countries in North Africa and in the Middle East right now. And uh, we see the Islamic State with now tens of thousands of fighters. And uh, it seems like uh, since history always just began uh, yesterday or today, that we kind of have a problem, regardless of even if you would argue uh, Bush and Obama got us into this mess. There's a huge problem of, uh, you know, bin Ladenite and Caliph Ibrahimite uh, loyal uh, jihadi militias all across uh, North Africa and the Middle East. And uh, so what should be done about it? I mean, if, if Coburn is saying that much is true, I think you and I can pretty much take that much for granted. But so what do we do, Sheldon, seriously? Well, the, the question that's relevant to the article is um, how much of that is going to come to the West? Uh, if stuff's going on over there, it's, it's not the problem that I am addressing in that piece. My piece was how can we in the West maintain our more and less open societies? They're not nearly as open as you and I would like, but uh, they're certainly somewhat open. I mean, we, you, you still can pretty much publish and and say what you want uh, in the U.S. more so than, say, France. <clears throat> so how can we maintain that as well as as be uh, have the government uh, vigilant against uh, jihadis coming or Islamists coming from or, or even self-radicalized? They don't need to have uh, gone over there. But uh, how, how are we going to guard against uh, events such as, uh, you know, Charlie Hebdo or, or the uh, or the hostage taking and, and murders in the uh, in the in the grocery in Paris. <clears throat> so my my point was, you can't you can't have an open society and a foreign policy that provokes uh, enemies because the government will will use that uh, provocation to then uh, curtail civil liberties uh, here at home, in the name of and a lot of people will go for it for that reason in the name of making sure, uh, you know, Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, incidents don't happen. So what. Uh, what we need to do is disengage. I think I think you agree with me on this. Disengage from Syria, Iraq, and those other places over there, and uh, at least reduce the threat that people are going to get angry and come over here, or that people here will be self-radicalized, as they put it, and uh, and do something uh, bad. I don't know that we can fully, uh, you know, guarantee it will never happen. I'm not sure the genie, you know, the genie's out of the out of the uh, the lamp. I'm not sure you can put the genie back. There are people with scores to settle and they still they still might feel that way even if we announced a uh, a credible non-interventionist foreign policy uh, tomorrow uh some people i think will still have um you know sc- scores to settle in their mind and so you know but i think typical normal police work can handle that without a surveillance state and all the other bad things that you and i complain about all the time mm. so yeah i mean it seems like even in that coburn article where he describes, um, you know, just how huge these movements have become. Uh, at the end, he still says, geez, I don't know. Maybe ask the Turks to close the border with Syria. <laughs> you know, like, he, he still isn't not recommending, um, 
a uh, and he's not a hardcore anti interventionist, I guess. He's just a journalist, right? He, he tries not to have too many of those kind of opinions or those broader things. Uh, so he'd be willing, I think, maybe even to to say, yeah, go ahead and bomb him if he actually thought so. Uh, it seems like that sometimes, but he's not saying that here. Uh, he seems to think, well, he seems to say what, you know, we can all tell that it's been our pol- our policy that's made it this way over the last yeah. dozen years, where when bin Laden, at the time George Bush let bin Laden escape into Pakistan, he brought a couple of dozen guys with him. The rest had already been exploded by the Air Force. That yeah. was all they had well, was a couple of dozen guys. Right. Well, right. I think if you look at the uh, the whole picture, uh, certainly since nine uh, nine eleven two thousand one, uh, it it doesn't say much for the logic of the of the Bush Cheney approach to all this and and basically Obama approach. Uh, as far as bombing, if they're concerned about self radicalization and lone wolves, uh, lone lone wolves a a, a stepped up uh, bombing campaign in Syria and uh, Iraq uh, c- certainly can't be counted on to make things any better. It's yeah. just going to accelerate and aggravate the very situation uh, that's that we've identified. But of course, you know, the establishment can't acknowledge that the problem is U.S. foreign policy. I mean, occasionally they do. I mean, you're fond of uh, quoting uh, that Petraeus uh, uh, testimony, which got him in trouble, mm-hmm. uh, and Max Boot, I guess, bailed him out of it when he when he acknowledged that our support for Israel kills uh, kills Americans. <laughs> And uh, but how many people have the courage to say that it, it won't even get discussed on the on the cable uh, television shows? I mean, I watch enough of these things. I don't know why. I guess I hope, the, you know, one day I'll tune in and there will actually be a discussion. They can't even acknowledge. They won't bring anybody on to say, you know, you know, as Ron Paul put it to uh, Giuliani back then in 2008, they're over here because we're over there yeah. or they or they may be over here because we're over there. Uh, you don't find anybody to say that. I mean, yeah, even Rand NBC. Paul is saying bomb him. That's a, in fact, he was asked, right. Right. so you still want bombing because it seems to just uh, make matters worse. And he says, no, I'm still for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're right. There's nobody in, in so, uh, politics, leading in politics who, who are, t- who is taking this position. Right. In politics uh, or Paul, it takes either. There's just, right. There's, there's only NBC, the former right. congressman there. I want to give credit to the only bright spot I can think of right now. And that's, uh, uh, Eamon Moyaldeen. The uh, the uh, correspondent uh, in uh, he's been in uh, Gaza and in elsewhere in the Middle East for NBC. And then he was stateside for a week or two and they would have him on like Morning Joe. And he was the only one saying this. He actually was saying this kind of thing, not as hard or, you know, as uh, firmly as he might have. But he was he was pretty good, certainly compared to everybody else, like, you know, Richard, uh, who's the head of uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Hots. Uh, all the, uh, yeah. Hots. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, that typical lineup. And there was uh, Eamon. Uh, saying some really good things, so give, I give him credit. Now they sent him back to, uh, to the Middle East. Uh, maybe they wanted to figure he he'll, he won't be able to say that so much if he's there. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I yeah, don't know. But it, 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 it's just incredible how this is lacking from the uh, public discussion. Right, and you know, actually, that Daily Beast piece about Rand Paul, uh, <clears throat> they've got it right. The premise of the question is right. Hey, Rand, the air war isn't working. It's making matters worse, apparently, and mm-hmm. so. There's a little bit of a, a crack in the narrative, but just barely. But I think that we ought to be able to rest assured that these Al-Qaeda guys and, and ISIS guys have proven that they are such bastards that they will not have. Uh, and they, they rule pretty crappy territory, too. They will not have the ability to rule for long, to stay in power for long. They're much more likely to burn themselves out if we stay out, just from a utilitarian view. But anyway, back in a sec. Hey, Al Scott here. If you've got a band, a business, a cause, or campaign, and you need stickers to help promote, check out TheBumperSticker.com at TheBumperSticker.com. They digitally print with solvent ink, so you get the photo quality results of digital with the strength and durability of old-style screen printing. I'm sure glad I sold TheBumperSticker.com to Rick back when. He's made a hell of a great company out of it, and there are thousands of satisfied customers who agree with me, too. Let TheBumperSticker.com help you get the word out. That's TheBumperSticker.com at TheBumperSticker.com. Hey, I'm Scott. Welcome back to the show, guys. I'm online with Sheldon Rich, and we're talking about his piece about uh, the open society and its enemies. War being the health of the state and all. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, man. Sheldon, I guess, uh, so right-wingers' point of view on uh, what it sounds like you're saying is just surrender to the bad guys. That uh, we can't win. 
And so we ought to just let them win because otherwise they might shoot up a mall or something. Well, it's it's not ours to win. Uh, here we are now mired in uh, a very complicated situation in the in the Middle East, Iraq and Syria in particular, but other places. <clears throat> Part of it is the the old uh, Shia Sunni uh, controversy. <laughs> Uh, but it's not, I don't think it's only that. I think there are other things. I think there are political and uh, ideological uh, disputes going on uh, within the various camps. I mean, I, I do believe it's very complicated. Uh, I don't know if it's going to burn itself out the way some people think or whether it's very strong the way I guess uh, Patrick uh, has said. It's interesting. You've had guests on who uh, take you know various sides of that question. And that's interesting. I'm not qualified to say whether ISIS is going to burn itself out soon, and there'll be a a, a, a bottom up awakening, uh, or or not. I mean, I just don't know. But but I think you know that's far away from us, and it, and it, it only gets closer to us when we're involved. And again, it's the Ron Paul uh, position. Uh, we can't solve these problems, uh, certainly not with bombing, uh, and you know, and drones and uh, other things, which has so alienated people. I mean, we know that the Paris actors were radicalized by Abu Ghraib and other, and other things. So uh, do we want more of that? Uh, th- that just doesn't seem the way, the way to, to go here. So it shouldn't be a question of, you know, who's going to win over there, us or them, because it's, it's not ours to win. I don't see how we, we quote, we can win, however you'd want to define we. Uh, you know, that's a big area with a lot of people and a, and a lot of old fights going on. And how the heck do we think, how presumptuous do you have to be? To think you can venture into that and and uh, solve those problems and and bring about you know liberal democracy, uh, I mean it, it's it just sounds totally crazy and I don't think it's being done out of an honest motive that this they can actually win this. I think the U.S. wants to is the best it can manage it because it's interested in resources and it's interested in uh, you know hegemony to keep others from being uh, hegemonic and of course it's interested in Israel, which wants to maintain its dominant position. So uh, all those things I think are going into it. The idea that the, the, somehow the U.S. can win it, I don't really think that's on the minds of the policymakers. Mm. All right. Now, so you talked about this earlier, the uh, the threat of, well, obviously there's people who don't even have to travel there in the first place, but what about battle-hardened Syrian war vets? I mean, this is the guys who have done the Syrian civil war and the Libyan war before that, the guys on the ground, they were the Iraq war vets made in, in Bush's last, you know, uh, Hell's Kitchen over there kind of thing. And so now um, uh, we have uh, thousands of veterans of the Syrian war, at least, let's say, hundreds and hundreds, with Western European passports. And, uh, I mean, what's the best we have? Is, like, the French National Police and... Intelligence services, our allies, the Turks, and, uh, you know, whatever other national police and spies in Europe to keep these guys, uh, you know, from, from coming into, to France and, and the rest of Western Europe to keep them from getting visas to the United States. Who, who are we counting on to track these guys for us and prevent them from coming back and, and doing more of these attacks? And you can see how they kill 17 people. They might as well have killed 3,000. They pretend, you know, the governments pretend it was September 11th all over again for 17 people dying, as Patrick Coburn says, playing right into their hands, of course, with the overreaction. But um, it seems like there's a lot of chaos to come, and who the hell's going to stop them after our side, the the U.S. and the West, our allies, have been backing the jihad in Syria for the last three years leading up to this thing. It's at four now. Right. Well, so it goes back to my uh, the first one of the earlier things I said, we want to uh, certainly minimize that uh, danger by uh, uh, announcing a new policy and then credibly implementing it. In other words, get the hell out of there. Uh, that uh, w- w- would make, the I think, the U.S. L- less of a target by uh, by some of those guys who, are, who desire to come over. Uh, but the question is then, the one I posed in the article, I mean, I, I, the, the title, uh, The Open Society and Its Worst Enemies, is a play, of course, on Karl Popper's two-volume book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. So I was drawing attention to its foreign policy. The foreign policy makers are the, are the greatest enemies because they make they make enemies for us, and then we have to worry about them. And then and then people are willing to accept civil liberties violations because we have to guard against these enemies, the very people you're referring to. So 
you know, how much do we want a police state because somebody may be able to sneak in? Even then, you're not going to uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, no government is that competent to, to make sure no bad person ever ever sneaks in or or gets in on a, on a, uh, a visa, you know, who uh, who otherwise would have been caught. They're, n- they're never going to be perfect. So, uh, you know, do, are we willing to just give up our, our, our security and our privacy because because of this? And uh, I'm not. I, I know a lot of other people who are not. And um, again, let's work on minimizing it by uh, changing our foreign policy. But that, that's not even on the table, right? Char- changing our foreign policy is not even an item of discussion. So yeah. all the all of it's going to be in how much uh, civil liberties violations are we willing to accept? And look what they're doing in in uh, in France. I mean, France had that great march. I know you've had comments about this already. Uh, they had the great march on behalf of free expression, and the next day they arrest 54 people, including a comedian who may be a nasty guy and uh, say nasty things, but he's just saying he's just saying things. Uh, do we want that? Are we are we drawn? Are we, are we going to be driven to that that sort of, uh, sort of uh, policy? And uh, and uh, I and uh, a lot of people I know are standing up. Uh, they don't have the forum, but we're standing up and saying. Hell no. We don't want to give up our liberties in the name of protecting us from the very enemies you created. Let's stop creating the enemy. Right. Well, you know, Robert Pape was on the show. This is, I think, as close as we can get to the influence on the policy from our side is Pape has explained that, you know, he has an audience at the Pentagon, at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I'm sure not at AEI, but, you know, uh, at, at some of these places. And apparently he has gotten it through their thick skull. I think even he said he talked to the National Security Council that ground troops is the thing that really causes the enemy. But then and he's also written about the um, how air power is is basically good for nothing as well. But I think, you know, it's sort of taken the place and it's sort of convinced them that, yeah, well, we'll just bomb them from the air and then that won't generate the terrorists for us or whatever when. You know, that that's not really the point. The point is ground forces are worse, not that drone strikes are great, <laughs> you know, but that's as close as we can get that and another CISPA and another Patriot Act and another, uh, you know, decade of Guantanamo and NDAA. Yeah. And- well, you know, I don't I don't know how this actually plays out. I wonder what Pape would say about this. I admire his work. Uh but it seems like ground troops would draw draw jihadis to the places where the ground troops are, right? So if you have ground, I'm not advocating ground troops. I'm just trying to trace the logic. If you have them in Syria or Iraq, then the jihadis go, can say, you know, hey, let's go kill Americans. Let's go to Iraq or Syria. But if it's from the air, and if it's drones, they can't kill Americans. So they may then think, hey, let's go over there. Let's go to their home, to, you know, their home court. And, and inflict some damage. So, but the problem you, is, is if, that if you have the ground troops there, then mm-hmm. yeah, it's an easier target. But you're also recruiting that many more of them. So it, at best, you're putting off the consequences. You know. Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't advocating ground troops over. No, I know. Air. When you say better, it depends on what your standard of better is. Well, it, I just it, mean, it, I, I think the point is that ground troops make some matter. Ground troops it, is seems to indicate that, no, they really mean to change our entire way of life, um, you know, well, rather than just we I, hate I mean, them for killing us, which already makes people pretty damn mad. Pape, Pape uh, of course, spends his full time studying this stuff, so far be it from me to uh, to be skeptical of it. But it just it just I just wonder whether uh, air power is that much, quote, better in the, in the respect he's talking about it. I mean. If I if I lived in a village and you know every day there are uh, jets or drones coming by and every once in a while they they uh, wipe out a, a block of homes or something I would I would uh, I wouldn't be too loving of the of the uh, car, country of origination even if there weren't ground troops so I don't know exactly how you measure you know which which they hate more ground troops or or uh, or air power uh, I, I don't know uh, my my focus is on can we have a free and open society if uh, if we're doing that stuff? And my answer is no. You know, maybe years ago you could, but not with cheap transportation now or with the Internet where you can have self-radicalization. Maybe in the 19th century you could have an empire and it not 
wouldn't come home so uh, forcefully. But I don't. I think those days are gone. Yeah, no, that's a very important point. You know, I keep thinking of that, but I never say it. But you just reminded me again. There's uh, the old Onion book, Our Dumb Century, where each page is a headline from each year of the 20th century. You know, and uh, right around 1901 or 1902 or something like that, it's Zulu sees Queen at Spear Point, and it's all about the the African pygmies with their spears sacking mm-hmm. London and and taking the queen hostage and all of this stuff and it and it just goes to show uh you know the inequity and the power in the war there and how how safe the english really are back at home while they're bringing all this violence to people uh you know mm-hmm. in the farthest reaches of africa that kind of thing but that is exactly what is no longer true as you said uh that's something that these guys are having a real hard time getting through their head that it's that easy, and that's why they killed Alaki. I don't think he was really running Al Qaeda over there, but man, he was making some YouTubes that were scaring the crap out of DC because that's all it takes now to get in some guy's head, and then you see how e- how easy it is to kill a few people with an AK-47. You know, and in fact, I think you and I've talked about this for years about in Somalia, where we've had all these Somalis who have gone, or Somali Americans who've gone from Minneapolis, where there's a huge population of Somali Americans, and there's been a dozen or two even that have gone to Somalia to fight. And it's yep. so easy to just consider, you know, not that I'm trying to give them ideas or whatever, but it's pretty obvious that they could just stay here and fight. And you know what I mean? They got the supreme uh, symbolic target, too, with that mall. That's a uh, as far as an economic target and all that. So, uh, yeah. it, you know, I think we've gotten off extremely lucky. If it's just a matter of time before we have enough of these lone wolves or very small cells of guys infiltrating and coming here and hitting soft targets, you know what I mean? Well, I hope not. Uh, you know, they still say the uh, the chances of uh, being a victim of, uh, of of that sort of thing is, is very small. Uh, well, the cops than... want to take credit, but they don't get it. They've only busted maybe one or two actual terrorists this whole time, yeah. uh, and the only one I can think of is Zazi, the Denver cab driver. The rest of them all got away with at least trying their attack, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's it's not it's definitely something that should be on our minds. But once again, you know, are we willing to give up our uh, what freedom we have left? I mean, we're, let's not fool ourselves. We don't have a fully open society, especially since nine eleven, with uh, with uh, indefinite detention and and uh, all the spying and the stuff that Snowden uh, let us know about. Uh, so we've already traveled down that road. Do we want to keep going down that road? Because again, uh, we're afraid people are going to come over here, but I don't believe there are, there are, there are people who ever would have dreamed of coming over here for that purpose. If it were not for Bush and Cheney and, you know, that whole string of misleaders that, uh, followed of course. up to the present day. And by the way, you know, for everybody listening, just so you know, at worst, I'm playing devil's advocate here. <laughs> you know, uh, I totally agree. I'm just, uh. Yeah. Now, obviously, the solution is to end all the intervention, but I just want to uh, to at least try to, you know, set up the argument where we're addressing the real world. And we're not, um, you know, downplaying either, you know, numbers or intentions or anything like that on the part of these guys, uh, you know, in the first place, because I think yeah, sure. the problem is much worse than it was when Obama inherited it from Bush. And at that point, it was a thousand times worse than it was after September 11th. So, yeah, that's right. I mean, there, you know, originally you had a few guys, a few hundred guys or whatever it was in in uh, Afghanistan and some perhaps uh, over the border or there over the Duran line in Pakistan. And now look where it is. <laughs> it's, you have franchises popping up all over the place. And uh, worse than that, because you have, you know, organizations which are broken off and have been condemned by the by the original organization, uh, namely uh, ISIS. ISIS. And uh, how is that any better than what uh, Bush faced on uh, December uh, on September 11th, 2001? Uh, It's not. He just he just dispersed it and and, and made it larger and, and made people more angry at us. You'll still hear people say today, yeah, but they attacked us on 9-11 and we haven't done anything. Yeah. Yeah, that was when the war started. Everybody knows that. Didn't you see yeah. the footage? Clear blue sky. Clear blue sky. That's all you need to know. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Sheldon. I sure appreciate you coming on the show and putting up with me. <laughs> My pleasure, Scott. Anytime. Okay. See ya. Bye.
Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it taste good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at darrenscoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darrenscoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and you get free shipping. Darrenscoffee.com. Oh, John Kerry's Mideast peace talks have gone nowhere. Hey, all Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at councilforthenationalinterest.org. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co.